Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Um, we'll give people a few minutes to join us um, before we get started. But if in the meantime, you'd like to please put your organization name and your country name in the chat um, so we can see where folks are calling in from. Start in just a couple of minutes. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. If you can go ahead and put your organization name and your country name in the chat, um, we can see where people are calling in from and we'll just start in just a couple of minutes. Welcome everyone. I see many of you are already introducing yourselves in the chat. Feel free to continue to do so um, and we'll get started in just one more minute. All right, I think we can get started. Welcome everybody. My name is Melissa Montes. I'm a senior program officer on the ASAP2 project. We are a PEPFAR and USAID funded project. And we're excited to welcome you today to our second webinar in our series of four um, webinars on strategic information. Um, and today's webinar will be discussing um, dashboard development and implementation for USAID local partners. And before we get started, I'll just do a little brief introduction on the ASAP project. Um, before um, our presenter um, continues with the webinar. Next slide, please. Just a few quick notes. Um, thank you everyone for introducing yourself in the chat. Please continue to do so if you're joining us just now um, and feel free to include your organization name and your country name. Um, throughout the webinar, we um, will have the opportunity to answer um, some of your questions. So if you can please use the Q&A box to ask any of those questions at any time during the webinar, and we'll stop a couple of times um, throughout the presentation to answer those questions. We also have a few polls during today's webinar, so those um, will pop up on your screen, and please feel free to answer those and participate in today's um, webinar. The presentation for today's webinar, um, as well as a recording, will be saved on ASAP's website, um, and we'll share a link to that in the chat shortly. Next slide, please. So just a little bit about the ASAP2 project. ASAP is accelerating support to advanced local partners. Um, and the goal of ASAP is to prepare local partners to have the capabilities and resources to serve as prime partners for USAID and PEPFAR programming. Um, so the, a couple of the strategic objectives we have are to strengthen local partners as they transition to receive PEPFAR funding, as well as comply with USAID prime partner regulations. Uh, we also prepare local partners to directly manage, implement, and monitor PEPFAR programs, um, as well as maintain consistent um, quality and achievement. Next slide, please. Some key results from ASAP 1 and ASAP 2. ASAP has supported a total of 126 local organizations in 18 different countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, mostly. 113 of those organizations are, have been local partner organizations, and 13 of those organizations were local government partners, um, so G2G support primarily. Next slide, please. 
You can see here um, the bolded countries are our current ASAP2 supported countries. I see many of you are um, calling in from some of these countries. Um, and additionally, you can see here some of our um, countries we supported during ASAP1 for a total of 18 different countries. Um, so we're thrilled to be able to support so many. Next slide. Um, for these webinars, um, all of these, uh, most of these webinars are um, available on demand. Um, as we've done a total, this will be our 86th webinar. And many of you have joined us for multiple of them. So thank you so much for returning. Um, and welcome to those of you who, of whom that this is your first webinar. We've had more than 19,000 attendees from 76 different countries. Um, and again, we'll share um, the link uh, to access some of these past webinars um, in the chat shortly. Next slide, please. Our webinars are available um, usually in three different languages. Um, primarily, we'll start with the English language of um, each webinar, and then a few weeks or later in the year, we'll also do the webinars fully in two other languages, in French and Portuguese. So if you'd prefer to uh, watch a recording or attend a webinars in different languages in French or Portuguese that is available to you. Um, that same link that we'll share in the chat, you can filter the webinars based on language so you can um, search uh, your preferred language. Next slide, please. Um, at where you can find the recordings, you can also download um, a PDF of the presentation of today's slides, as well as um, many of the other webinars that we've done in the past. Um, as well as watch the recording um, so you can follow along or share with others um, in your organization um, to do some learning together. Next slide, please. We have many upcoming webinars. Um, the next couple of weeks, we'll have webinars, one in Portuguese um, on uh, leadership and governance, um, building effective boards, um, and a French language um, webinar on April 6th on business development. Just a reminder that those are fully in um, those languages in Portuguese and French. Um, so if that is something that interests you, that is available to you. Additionally, in, um, later in April, we'll have the following two um, webinars of this four-part series um, on strategic information, one on advanced um, analytics for data-driven dri decision-making, um, and the second on practical um, application and GIS methods. Next slide, please. Um, we are excited to have um, Andres Montaner back with us for our second um, in this webinar series, second webinar of this series. Um, Andres is the Senior Monitoring and Evaluations Manager at Right to Care. Um, and Right to Care is a South African-based uh, USAID local partner, um, as well as an ASAP2 consortium partner. So with that, I will pass it over to um, Andres, who will start today's webinar. Um, and again, feel free to answer, ask questions in the chat, uh, excuse me, in the Q&A box and participate in the chat as well. Andres, over to you. Andres, sorry, you're muted. All right, I hope you can hear me a bit better. Um, okay. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you to all of the participants um, here today. Um, as Melissa mentioned, this is uh, part two in a four-part series for data utilization um, done by Right to Care. So our previous webinar, we went over um, how to choose the correct visual um, for data um, visualization. So this is one over um, different types of graphs and charts where we talked about the differences between a pie chart or a bar chart, um, different types of bar charts, um, comparisons versus compositions. So if you're more interested in learning about um, actually choosing the visuals for your dashboard, um, I would definitely refer you back to uh, webinar one. And then upcoming, we'll be going into, as Melissa mentioned, uh, data analytics and GIS. And today's focus is going to be uh, the process of actually building a dashboard. So dashboards are, of course, uh, very exciting and potentially flashy, but there is a bit of a process to actually get to that final end result. Um, so to do that, today we're going to go over data sources, data submissions, and visualization options. 
So these are basically the steps that um, I'm going to be laying out for you in terms of the process of building a dashboard. So the data source is going to be where is the data coming from? Is it coming from a hospital? Is it coming from an existing database? Um, is it maybe some sort of survey result? Um, there could be any sort of data source and you could potentially visualize all of these. But then of course you have to actually get to the process of visualizing. So how are you going to be moving your data? So once you understand where your data is coming from, you potentially then need to also optimize how you're going to be moving that data from its data source to its potential output, whether that's for a report or for a dashboard or some sort of other uh, visualization or review. Um, this process is going to be your data submission process or potentially if you remember Remember from uh, our first webinar, this is going to be an example of just like a data processing system, uh, but we won't go too much into that. And then finally, we're going to talk about visualization options and spend some time doing actually a bit of a tutorial of those visualizations. So we're going to do some uh, visualizations in Excel and then also bring over that same template that's in Excel over to Power BI. Um, so I believe that you had two Excel files shared with you um, to start this webinar. Potentially, you could take this time just to download them. We're not going to get into them yet, um, but we are going to be looking through those and actually using them later on in this webinar. So feel free to download those two Excel files, and we're going to be using the programs Excel and Power BI, both of which are free, um, but we'll get into those logistics as we get a bit closer to it. All right. So to start us off, we're going to again be talking about data sources, which is again, where is your data coming from? So depending on the level that your program is at and also potentially your own involvement in the program, your data could be coming from uh, several different sources. So I just put them in the categories of physical or paper, paper-based data sources, software-based, and then online capturing-based. So starting off with paper-based, this is probably going to be where maybe you're collecting data um, either from some sort of data collection tool um, on paper, which is most likely going to be done maybe in a facility or while you're interacting uh, potentially with a client or some sort of uh, program that you're supporting. So potentially these could be done, again, they're going to be capturing on paper. So you're going to have some sort of rubric and then you're going to be filling out this rubric and it's going to be on paper. And so it's on paper, so it's going to be very easy to fill out and potentially print out. But there's also going to be quite a bit of potential uh, weaknesses uh, with paper, such as the fact that if you lose a piece of paper, you have now actually lost data. So if you have, um, again, going back to data demand for the program, if you understand what sort of data you need to collect, and then you're going about actually collecting that data. Making sure that the data is properly collected is going to be critical to your program because um, this is how you're going to be measuring your success rate as well as just monitoring uh, the challenges and the activities of your program. So you want to make sure, of course, that you have the data that you need and you keep it safe. So paper-based is going to be very convenient, but it's going to open you up to potential uh, compromises in data. This is not to say don't use paper, but just understand that maybe there could be some um, some things potentially happening to data stored on data, excuse me, stored on paper, such as you could have a rainy season and then all of your paper files are suddenly a bit wet and moldy and it's a bit hard to read the names or the months or just any sort of critical information that you're recording it could become a bit lost and potentially become inaccurate because you can't actually tell what it says. Um, or maybe even you just have a new data capturer and they're not fully up to speed with the way that you're normally capturing your data. So they potentially just um, actually make a few typos or excuse me, not typos, but misspellings, which could be potentially leading to inaccurate readings. There could be poor handwriting. And again, maybe you even just lose a paper, a piece of paper as you're walking down the down your corridor. So paper based is. Um, I made it, I feel like I made it sound a bit scary, but it's probably where most of us are starting. And of course, if you're in a facility, a lot of your records are actually going to be paper based. But I'm trying to um, kind of keep in, have you keep in mind the issues that come could come with this. 
So as opposed to paper-based, you could also have software-based, um, which would then start to bring in things such as Excel or any other local uh, computer program. And when I say local, I mean that in the sense that you wouldn't need an internet connection to use it. So when you're using Excel, you could potentially be using it in a very remote area, um, and maybe there's no network, and it's, uh, you don't have cell access. But as long as you're able to turn on a computer, and you already have the Excel software loaded on the computer, you'll be able to complete your templates and collect all of your data. And potentially also, um, since it's on a computer in Excel, you'll be able to start to move it around a little bit. So with paper-based, you're going to have an actual big register book or collection of files. But while with software, you're going to basically just have a bunch of rows and then or lists of information. And then from there, you can start to more easily organize it in a way that maybe you only want to look at the men or you would only want to look at the women or you only want to look at the information from the previous month. Of course, you could do this with paper-based, but it's not going to be quite as easy. And so you could save some time and resources if you're using this as a software-based thing and you could get those results that you're trying to see uh, quite a bit quicker. Um, so this is an example of a software data source. And some other strengths uh, within that is you can actually start to do some visualizations in that same template. So uh, we'll do that in uh, one of our demos today. But basically, as soon as you have an Excel sheet and it has information on it, you can start to highlight some of that information. And then from there, either put it in a, a separate table or potentially start to make graphs with it um, on the same Excel file again, and this is without internet access. So potentially this is just like another advantage that you could have when you're using your data on Excel as opposed to paper-based. And um, another little strength that you could get with um, Excel is you could also use validations within a template. So that's gonna be what we go over our first demonstration today. Um, and when I say validation, that's basically a way of making sure that your data is input correctly. We're going to go into some more details on that. But of course, um, you might have heard the expression garbage in, garbage out. So a validation at the point where you're starting to collect your data can help to make sure that the data that you're correct, uh, collecting is actually being accurately collected and you're not getting any sort of typo or just a copy paste error. So this is another strength of the software based. And then kind of a step above that is going to be some sort of direct online capturing system potentially through a desktop or a smart device or tablet. So as we go up in levels here, you're going to see that each one kind of requires a little bit more support. So through a direct online capturing, you're going to need to have some sort of website built and potentially also have a steady internet connection. Um, so, but again, depending on your level and the program and the size of your program, um, you're going to have to see which one of these is most appropriate uh, for you to use. But if you go up in these levels, there are also advantages that come, of course, with the additional uh, resources required. So for the direct online capturing, you can do basically all of the same things that you could do with Excel. Potentially, you could do some visualizing. You could do a bit of data organizing. But it's going to be hosted on a website instead of on a local Excel file. So an example of one of these sorts of data sources is going to be something such as DHIS2 or DATUM. And I think uh, most of us here have maybe interacted with this a bit. And so what those are is they're actually physical websites that you would go to and you would submit your data to these websites. Either you could submit an Excel or CSV file um, to some link, or you could actually go through and fill out individual little fields or entry points for each uh, piece of information. So potentially, if you're measuring um, how many nutritional packs you've given out in the past month, you would go and say, I've given out this many to uh, men in this age group, this many to women in this age group, and you're kind of manually capturing all of your information on this website. And so potentially, if you're a larger organization or a funder, your source of data is actually going to be from that uh, website, from that direct online capturing system. All right. So... Those are basically the categories of where your data could be coming from. I'm assuming most of us are going to be coming from the top two categories, which is paper-based and Excel-based. 
but potentially if you have the capabilities or you're a larger organization, you could also have one of these online capturing systems, um, even within just your organization. So potentially your facility staff or your people who are most on the ground could be collecting data and putting them directly either into a tablet or into um, an internet linked computer. Um, but of course that's a bit higher. So most likely, again, we're gonna mostly be using paper and software based. And so after you've identified your data source, because again, we're here to make dashboards, right? So the first step is understanding where the data is coming from. And now we have to understand the best way to move it. Um, so you could potentially look at different methods for data submission to get them to um, some sort of database or where all of the data is now together and you can use it. So how are you going to bring your data together? Are you going to do some sort of manual data processing? And this is going to be at the most basic level, you'll be going to your facilities or your data collection points and collecting files, putting them together, and then most likely um, either completing a large register book or you're going to be putting them all together and then starting to copy them over to an Excel file but you're doing some physical collecting of these files and you're bringing them together. Potentially another method of manual data processing is just emailing or WhatsApping your daily or weekly or monthly um, reports or templates to your manager. So even though it's online or excuse me, uh, using network such as uh, email or WhatsApp, we're still gonna call this a manual processing, processing because you're actually, uh, there's two people that are actually have to act in order for it to be completed. The sender has to actually put the, together the information and send an email to their manager. And then the manager has to actually open the email or the WhatsApp and then start to put it together with all of their other staff. Um, so this, this, this action of or process of manually collecting all of the different submissions from all of your different supported facilities is a type of manual data processing. And you're going to be collecting it and organizing it and potentially making um, kind of a larger file that now includes all of your data um, from that time period, from the facilities or the activities that you support. So a slightly more advanced version of that is going to be a network database. Um, so you, you're still going to need to be doing a submission. So someone in the facility is still going to be having to complete a template and then send it off or put it somewhere, but it's going to become automatically a part of a database. So a manager is now free to do something else because previously they were spending their time uh, receiving all of the templates from all of their activities and then putting them together. But if you're able to have a network database, then basically your facilities or your individual activities can just submit their folder or their template or their files to this database. And then the database will automatically accept it and kind of um, it will become the data that they submit will now become part of the database. So you kind of have this growing collection of data over time as um, your activities are routinely submitted into it. But no one is really organizing this, this database annually. You're going to have to set that up with developers and most likely they're going to be using programs um, such as SQL where they will host this large database. But once it's been set up, you can create uh, secure file transfer pro protocols or SFTPs, uh, which are using a network connection. And then you're basically able to drop the file in and it will automatically become part of this database. So it's kind of cutting out the manual organization aspect of it and basically allowing your facilities or your activity managers to just drop their uh, files into a computer. And then from there, they will become a part again of this larger um, network, or excuse me, this larger database. And you do not necessarily need network to do this. You could also have it set up in such a way that eventually you would be dropping these files or submitting these files through email in such a way that each of your activity managers could send an email and then the email would be linked to this database. So there's multiple ways that you could have the submission be made and it doesn't necessarily require um, a steady or constant internet connection. 
Um, so it might sound a bit fancy or resource uh, intensive, but at the same time, you're definitely able to do this um, as long as you ha have um, basically a developer who's able to work with some sort of database software and build a database. And then from there, as long as you identify the best way to submit data, which is either going to be likely through an SFTP secure file transfer protocol or an email submission, um, you could still manually put data into a database. Um, but I feel like once you get to that point, you'll likely understand also the ways of doing these automatic uh, submissions. So that's all to say that there is that possibility to do a network database, but of course you could also be doing this um, data collection and organization manually and just kind of sharing around Excel files that become larger and larger as you have all of your programs data kept on them. But with a network, um, with a network database, it's a bit more kind of protected. So the, the, the data, all of your data is always on a server or kind of a backed up network. Whereas if you're sh manually sharing around an Excel file, um, it is potential, there's potential that maybe someone could like start to enter data in the wrong place. And then it become very challenging to understand where the wrong data was put in. Um, and so it's just a little bit easier to manage on the network database because you can kind of see all of the changes made to it. And it's a bit more of a secure storage as opposed to just sharing around um, an Excel file manually. Okay, and then again, so the last. I'm, sorry, Andres, I'm just going to interrupt you for one second. We're having some um, participants that aren't able to see your slides. So I'm wondering if you could stop sharing for a minute and reshare. And we're going to see if that solves the issue. Sure, no and, problem. Um, also, just as a note, Jeff turned off your video just uh, to see if that may also boost your um, information or boost your video. All right. Great. Sorry, Thank everybody. Just stick with us for a minute. We noticed in the chat that some of you were having issues with the um, presentation, being able to see it. Not everybody was having the issue, but we did notice quite a number of people, which is not that common for our webinars. So we're just going to try a couple of troubleshooting things. Stick with us for just a minute. All right. I have stopped sharing and resharing. Are you able to see the slideshow? Excellent. Yes, I am. So. Um, Feel free, everybody in the chat, let us know if you weren't able to see it and you are now, um, let us know. Oh, it looks like we fixed it. So thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Andres. And I'll go back off camera. Thanks so much, Andres. OK, it's about that. Um, so we talked about manual ways of collecting our data and putting it together, potentially using a network um, through software such as SQL. Um, and then lastly, we're going to be going to that same category of direct online capturing. So while this could also be a method of, um, of a data source, this could also be used for data submissions. Um, so potentially your data could be coming from a direct online capturing system, but you could also use your direct online capturing system, it's a mouthful, um, for data processing in the sense that you could visualize your data on the internet and potentially use pivot tables or um, do some sort of filtering on a data set in the same way that you would use for DHIS2 or DATUM. You could also have program-specific uh, websites where, again, your own program would be able to, um, once you've submitted a file into the website, you'd be able to um, view this past month's information or uh, potentially organize it by a certain indicator and look at it over time. So you could potentially have dashboards built into your online capturing systems. And you could have all of this as one kind of web-based application. But again, this is going to require a little bit more resources. Um, so if you have the capabilities, then you could do this and it could save you some time. Um, but otherwise, we'll stick with our traditional methods of um, using Excel. And most likely, a data submission method is going to be not just one of these categories, but at least two or three of them. So a lot of the programs that uh, we have used or supported will incorporate both um, kind of manual data capturing at a facility, but then um, potentially facilities would be submitting their Excel files to their managers, and then their district managers would be submitting these files 
to an online website where then the program or the country directors would then start to look at the data uh, through a website, whereas in the facilities or in the districts using a network database that requires um, basically less network and it's a little bit um, simpler and more accessible. So you would really need to assess um, the level of accessibility that your users would have and then makes most likely pick the most appropriate one um, to save you the most time, but also make the most sense uh, for your settings and for your context. Okay. And then I spoke about this a little bit before, but a data verification method. So these are another way to save you time, use your resources efficiently. And this is basically a way to make sure that your data is captured correctly at the source. So for um, example, I'm assuming most of you again have maybe used DHIS2 or DATM. And if you have, you'll be entering information in an online website, and then that website will potentially reject your data if it doesn't match its requirements. Um, so for example, if you put words in a place that there's supposed to be numbers, it's going to say, uh, try again. Or if your numbers don't add up, so maybe your, um, your positives and your negatives, so your do not add up to your total, maybe your total male and total female don't add up to the total. So there are these kind of logic checks um, that can be built into data submission methods to make sure that the data is actually in sense. Um, we're about to get into an example of those sorts of formulas. So if that doesn't make sense yet, um, that's fine. Just stick with me and we'll, we'll go through it. Um, but in addition to seeing those sorts of verification methods on an online capturing system, you could also build those in to an Excel template. And that's going to be the first demonstration we do. Um, and basically, once you build those verification methods into an Excel template, um, again, you'll be finding ways to improve your data capturing efficiency at the source so that the people that are filling out your templates are going to very quickly be able to see maybe they need to double check um, one data category or, oops, excuse me, be able to double check one data category or, um, um, lost my train of thought. Double check on a data category or potentially just see where they need to um, investigate their data a little bit. So a verification method is a way to, again, check that the data is actually accurate as you're capturing it and it's not making any sort of illogical sense. Um, again, we'll get into some examples there. But other than using a formula for verifications, you're most likely going to be doing this manually. So if you're not using formulas, you're most likely going to be sending this um, to your managers or your program leads. And then they're going to be the ones who go through and look at the information or your data captured and make sure that it makes sense. So they'll be checking different sorts of logic rules by hand. Again, do your totals add up? Um, if you claim to have treated so many people in November, but then the year's total is a little bit less than that, um, maybe there's like a bit of a data discrepancy there and they're going to go and check and investigate. So these verification methods are always done in any sort of reporting, but you could save yourself time when you're doing it at the program or the country level and actually start to verify your data even as you capture it in a template. Um, again, to help you use your resources efficiently and you can help you save a bit of time when it's time for uh, reporting. All right, so we're about to get into a demonstration, but before that, I just wanna make sure everyone is still with me. So we're gonna do a poll. And question number one is, how can validations be built into Excel templates? Um, and then you've got some options there. And if you're doing questions at the same time, question two is what is not the discussed method of data submission? I will quickly stop sharing just to look at the results.
So number one is talking about how those validations we were talking about, again, can be built through a template. And number two is talking about the different methods of moving your data from its data source to its output. In this case, if that output is going to be um, a dashboard, but as you collect your data, you're most likely going to be using it for quite a few things, reporting, um, internal monitoring, uh, funder reports, annual reports to this person or that party. So how exactly are you moving your data? And then just the question here is, what is not one of the uh, excuse me, discussed methods of that movement or submission? All right, and I see we've got some results back in. And as you can see on the screen, okay, great. Most of us got number one correct. How can validations be built into Excel templates? That's through formulas. We're about to get into an example of that. Um, so good job there. Network is again, just an internet requirement. Um, review is just a manual review and SFTP is a type of data submission um, related to uh, network databases. So in this, ca in this case, uh, that's correct. Formulas is how we do our validations in Excel. And then what is not a discussed method of data submission? Uh, very good. Verbal confirmation um, is, was not one of the ones that we discussed. So physically carrying records could be a way of moving your data because potentially you're just going to a facility and you're um, physically picking up the records from the facilities and then you bring it um, to the district office and you start to uh, collect your data and organize your data in that way. So you could actually be physically picking up copies, or excuse me, copies from maybe different facility wards or different facilities and you could actually be collecting your data um, from this method though email and online capturing will do a little bit faster. Okay, and so now we're going to finish off our slideshow and get into a demonstration. Oops, excuse me. So in terms of visualizing your software or visualizing your data, you're going to need to pick a data visualization software. And so like all of the other methods discussed so far, there's going to be more fancy versions and more basic versions. And so you're really going to have to um, discuss and assess with your own program as to which is going to be the most fitting to your needs. So at a more basic level, but also covering all of the basics is Excel. You don't need internet for this and it's completely free. Otherwise you have options of Looker, Domo, Tableau, Power BI, Databox, and a lot of these have different capabilities. Some of them will allow you to link your visuals online as a part of those online capturing systems that I was referring to. Um, other of them will make reporting a little bit easier and they can automate uh, full reports with visuals in them. There's gonna be a range of cost and a range of kind of network requirements or even just physical space to download for each of these programs. So you do need to, again, internally discuss with your program management and your m &E teams to decide which one is best to use um, for your data visualization. Assuming most of us already would use Excel and in this uh, demonstration today, we're gonna do a quick Power BI demonstration to show you how to use um, Power BI to visualize your data and potentially also have a rubric or a template for uh, a dashboard. Now Power BI, I'm focusing on that one because it's free and so you can, well at least there's a free version of it. There's a free version of it that will allow you to use it offline, uh, similarly as how Excel is used. So as long as you have the system downloaded on your computer, um, you can use most of the capabilities and you can make visuals, you can make dashboards and it's all, it's all fun. But potentially, if you had the extra resources and you decide that you would like to go this way, you could also um, pay for the advanced version of Power BI 
or you could pay for one one of the other um, options listed here. There are, again, plenty of different data software for visualization, um, and a lot of them are really quite wonderful, very cool. So do a little bit of research before you decide which one you want to buy. Um, but today, again, we're gonna start out with Power BI. And uh, let's see. So I think that can basically bring us to our demonstration. So if you have the Excel files downloaded that were shared in the chat earlier, please make your way to the one titled Template Demo ASAP, and then you can open that up. That is an Excel file, so if you have a software that can open Excel, then you are all good to go. So I'm just going to wait a minute and hope that we're all able to open that successfully. So what that file is, is an example of a monthly template for, for reporting. So you'll notice that there are um, quite a few program indicators. So this is a monthly template for um, an HIV treatment program where the categories of treatment are broken up into prevention and support, testing, treatment and viral suppressing, and lastly, validations. Um, but before we get into the validations, I just want to quickly go over the format of the template. So we've got the testing tab. So you can see that we've got a facility name, which is actually entered on the first tab, prevention. And then once the facility name is entered, um, that's where it carries over to all of the other tabs. And then you can see going down, you have different age and gender groups. So at the top, you've kind of got uh, the total numbers, and then you've got the total male, or excuse me, total female, total male. Um, you've got different age categories. So if you remember again from webinar one, one of the first things you want to be doing when you're deciding how to um, process and collect your data is understand again the data demand and data use. So this template was built around the fact that uh, the program needs to make reports with all of these different age categories and sex categories. Um, so the fact that there's a less than two and up to, or excuse me, zero or less than two months category and two to 12 months category means that there is a need for data to be collected at that level. In the same sense that there is also female less than 15, female greater than 15, that means that there is a reporting requirement or a data utilization um, for that exact category. And then going down, of course, you have all of the, the little individual data capturing um, fields where data capturers are actually putting their information in. All right, so that's a template. And the validations tab is then the place that the staff that are completing this monthly template are able to quickly validate their data. And so again, we spoke about validations as a way to make sure that data is being captured correctly, either at a submission point, um, such as when you're doing online submissions and then it is either accepted or rejected based on a criteria, but you could also build those criteria into a template. So a quick one here, uh, one of the requirements for this program um, so the way that the validation tab is laid out is that the validation rules or the requirements are on top. And then you'll notice those same age and categories going down the side. So anywhere that there's a true means that the validation passes. But as soon as you see a false, this means that at this cell for this age group, there is some sort of validation that needs to be checked. Um, so the way that... Um, you could check that is by, so we can see that there's a false here. So we want to go and investigate this uh, validation rule. We could either look at the validation rule written on the top and see that total BMMC circumcised must be equal to the techniques. Um, so that would be how many people were cert uh, circumcised surgically and how many people were circumcised with the device. So the total of those two methods must equal to the actual total number we have recorded. So this is just a rule to make sure again that um, we're not making any silly mistakes as we capture our data. So 
we can see as we quickly look through that we have a false. So let's check out. You can see when you're in the false cell, we have, if you want to go straight to the formula, you can see the formula in the cell. So this is a true or a false. Again, if it's passing this validation rule that we have written on the top, it will come out as true. But if it's not, it automatically will write out false. So we can see on the prevention and support sheet at G41, that value should be equal to prevention and support sheet K41 plus prevention and support sheet O41. So this is going to be, if we're looking at the rule, the first bit must be the total circumcised value. And then these two additions would be, one would be surgical technique and one would be device technique. And because there's a false written, that means that this formula is, is false. But as we said, it should be true. So let's go and check that information. We could see that it's males 20 to 24, and we're looking at um, the circumcision numbers. So here is total circumcised. So we're going to be looking at this row, and then we're, or column, excuse me. And then we have K, which is the total um, surgical. And then we have O for total device based. So we're going to be looking in these rows, and I believe it was male 20 to 24. All right, so I think you can start to see the problem here. We've got four, but, but then again, we've, we've got a zero for uh, um, surgical, and we've got a zero for device base. So these should be equaling here. We've got a four that should equal to something plus something is four. So because there's a false, we can potentially, if we are our data capturer, we can go back to our records. We could see um, maybe this four should actually be a zero, or maybe there should be a four in one of these categories, or a one and a three. But because we see this false on the validations tab, we know that we should quickly come here and fix this before we actually move on and submit our data to the manager or the funder. Um, and so now I've put a four here to potentially make these add up. So again, let's just quickly highlight everything. This must equal to this one plus this one. So we've got a four. Or maybe to really demonstrate it, we could do a two and a two. Then we come over to validations. And previously, this was false. And now we can see the true. So just by putting these formulas in as an extra sheet in your template, you're able to assist your data capturers um, to uh, quickly check their information and make sure that it is actually correct. So now we're going to just quickly do two examples of writing those formulas. Where's the first one? There we go. All right. And if you have this sheet downloaded, if you want, you could follow along with me. And of course, you can be interacting with it. You could be testing these rules, play around with the data in the first three tabs, um, but maybe do that after the webinar. And for now, we can follow along. So if you want to make a one of these formulas to read true or false, you would first just start with an enter, or, or an equal sign, excuse me. Uh, you start with an equal sign. And then at this point, I want to match the age category um, with the, um, the template age category. So here we're going to start at uh, less than two months or zero to less than two months. And what I'm going to be looking at for is this indicator, L and D test positive must be equal or less than L and D test. So what this is saying um, in common terms is that uh, you cannot have its labor and delivery. You cannot have more test positive then you've had total tests for labor and delivery, um, which should make sense. But let's look at the template and or the template to fill out this formula. So again, to start it, all you have to do is click on a cell, hit hit uh, equal sign, 
And then as long as you've hit equals and you can see the equals up here on this formula bar, then you're good to go. But be careful where you click because every cell that you click, it will immediately, as you can see, pop up here. So if you're clicking around, you're going to start adding cells to your formula without realizing it. So just be careful and you could delete them if they accidentally pop up. But, uh, this is a testing, these are testing indicators. So I'm coming over to test and I'm going to find L and D, uh, labor and delivery, which luckily I know where it is because it's a bit of a big template. So you're gonna find that at rows um, a, T, and A, U. And again, the rule was L and D positive. So it's going to be this rule, or excuse me, this column. And we're going to start at the age category of less than two um, months, or zero to less than two months. So I'm going to click here for positive. And then now you can see that that is auto-populated up here in my formula bar. I'm going to put a... Um, less than and then an equals to sign and here I'm going to now click total test and hit enter and so now it's there so what we've done is we've clicked on a cell we've hit the equals sign to start writing our formula and then from there we picked our two indicators that we're going to be looking at our L and D test positive must be less than or equal to L and D total tests. And then to have that fill out the rest of the row, you can just double click it. And then you'll see that it, boom, we filled out our row. And if we're capturing data up to this point, we can very quickly see that there is a false. And we can also check that. Um, hopefully you guys are following or all, excuse me, following along on your own Excel sheets. So hopefully you know where to go and you could find this. You could either look for the labor and delivery categories, or you can click on the formula and look exactly at the cells, AU23 and AT23. Or you could look for female 25 to 29. So let's check it out. Make sure that it is actually working. We're gonna, I'm going to go for females 25 to 29. I can see for test positive, I have eight. But for total tests, I have zero. So this is indeed incorrect. So our data capturer can know to come here. They forgot to include the one. They just said zero. Um, but as a word of uh, caution, as soon as you introduce data validations, it's often tempting for your data capturers just to fix them without investigating. So I've made this a 10, but it's very possible that this eight didn't even need to be here. Maybe this should be zeros completely, and this eight should actually be in another category. So the goal of validations is not just to get all trues, but to actually check your data source and make sure that it is correct. Um, you don't just want to pass validations, you want to make sure it is correct. So we're going to do one more example of this uh, validations formula. Hopefully at this point, you guys can do this on your own. If you're following along, feel free to try it out. But um, we're going to start out with an equal sign. And from here, let's look at our rule. We see that the um, indicator TX cur, which is just current on treatment, must be equal to and then we have three categories. We have MMD, which is just how long your prescription is or multi-month dispension of drugs. Um, your prescription is less than three months, three to five months, or six plus months. So in order to be on, on treatment, you automatically must be in one of these categories. Because if you're on treatment, you're receiving drugs. And then this is keeping track of uh, which category of drug dispensation you're in. But these totals should equal to each other if your um, data is making sense or is valid. So how we're going to do this, we started with an equal sign. We're going to go find the TX cur indicator. And then we're going to find these three MMD um, indicators as well. So it's the exact same setup as just with two. 
um, two variables, but this time we're going to be using a few more. So for TX cur, we come over to treatment. Here we find TX cur. Again, we're starting at this highest age category. Um, potentially, you could start a bit lower, but then you would have had to start lower in the categories for the validations tab. Um, and because in the validations, I started at equals to, let's just get rid of that. Um, because I started at equals to uh, two to less than two, when I come over here, I'm going to also have to start at uh, less than two months, that is. So we have TX cur is now selected. We can see that up here in our formula tab. So TX cur must be equal to, and then we're going to have to add up three categories this time. So I'm doing TX cur, and I'm adding less than three months plus three to five months, plus six months or more. And I close my bracket. Okay, so if we look at the formula sheet here, we can see we've got our first indicator or variable written out, and then we're having it needs to be equal to three different categories added up together. So we're looking well, I'll come back to it in a minute. We're looking at TX cur. We're looking at MMD, uh, three to, less than three, three to five, and six plus. So this one must be equal to the total of these two. And in order to have it uh, take effect, all you have to do is hit enter, and automatically it will hit true. So in terms of popping up a true or a false, you don't have to do anything. As soon as you just put your formula in, the true or false will pop up automatically. And again, to have it fill out, we scroll down. Uh, we can quickly check this category. Um, looking at the time, we're going to go a bit quick here. So we're going to do uh, males 35 to 39. And again, we're looking at those TX cur um, equaling to those other three categories. So we have males, 35 to 39. We're looking at TX cur, less than three, uh, less than three months, three to five, and six plus. All right. So, so for TX cur, we have a zero, but then over here, in six months or six, six months or more, we have a one. So there must be some sort of mistake uh, with this data capturing. Either they forgot to include um, this gentleman over here as someone who's currently on treatment, or uh, this number one here should actually be included somewhere else. Or maybe it's just a typo and actually be a zero. Um, but regardless, you could use this. We've used this rule. We found a place that there's a bit of a data discrepancy, and then we'll investigate it, go to our records, and um, decide how to actually correctly input this data. So you could see how this sort of tool could help you uh, more accurately collect your data when you're um, collecting your data. Uh, basically, when you're processing your data and you're putting all of your activities together, all of the different facilities, or all of the different months, as you're collecting it, especially if it's a large amount of data, this can help you collect accurate information at the source. Um, and in ter terms of making it turn red, that's just a small thing. Uh, you can do that through conditional formatting. So from here, you would um, highlight your data that you would like to apply this condition to, which in this case is all of our true falses. We're going to go to conditional formatting. We're going to highlight cells that are equal to false. Um, at this point, it's highlighting some extra ones, but that's fine. You can just put the little quotes around it, and then it will only highlight the exact words written as false, and you can make it as a red text. You could change it to a yellow text. But we can also go to our trues, make them all green, and then from there, it's basically just a way to quickly highlight, again, um, any areas that you would need to go to. So I've just made the falses red, 
so that um, we can easily identify them as um, areas that we're going to need to look at. Red text. Great. Okay, so this brings us to our next poll and also our first set of questions. Um, let me share that poll here. What symbol is used to start a template validation formula? So how would you start uh, to write that true-false um, validation formula? And do you need to add a function to the formula for true-false to be displayed? And also at this time, we're going to do a first round of questions on data validations as well as the um, kind of data collection methods and submission methods that we've talked about so far. Um, after this, we're going to move into uh, actually visualizing our data, first with Excel and then with Power BI. But I want to make sure that we're clear first on our data capturing, our data sources, and our submit and me uh, submission methods. Um, so I will take a break, look at some questions, and please uh, continue with this uh, poll as well. All right, excellent. I can see the responses to the uh, polls, and you guys did very well. Um, is there a symbol that needs to be used to start the validation formula? It is the equal sign. Almost all of you got that correct. And then in terms of do we need to add any sort of function for that formula for the true-false to be displayed, the answers there were a bit more split. And just to reiterate, um, that's a no. You do not need to include anything in your formula as long as you have that equal sign if your formula is true then the true will automatically pop um, so if one plus if one plus one does equal two it will automatically uh, give you a true but if for any reason there's like an error and the equals does not actually equal to each other then that's when that false will pop up automatically. So you do not need to add anything in order for the true false to be uh, displayed. It's just a part of the um, formula as it is. Okay, I'm gonna look at a few of these questions at this point. Again, if you have any questions on the formula for a template or the data sources slash uh, submission methods, um, we're going to take a few minutes here just to look at this. I can see um, how can we develop a simple database using Excel that can help us capture data and validate. All right. So if you're going to use a database with Excel, I would it would it would really need to first go around again identifying what information you need to be capturing. So if you're capturing information at um, a total, um, looking at kind of just the total numbers done for each activity, then from there you can probably make some sort of a data table, similarly to the one that we saw as an example, but maybe you wouldn't need so many categories. You could just have um, the, the types of data or information that's relevant to your program. And then from there, because it's organized on a table, it becomes much easier to copy and paste those um, numbers and get your um, get your totals that you need. And if you could potentially be keeping different um, different copies of that total as it grows. So you could see the copy 
of your Excel file from November, and then you could see how those numbers are starting to change as you include the December numbers, and they're kind of growing over time. Or potentially you could include months as, or like a date captured as one of the, um, as one of the pieces of information captured in the Excel. And then at that point, you wouldn't need to kind of timestamp the file because you're keeping track of when the date was captured alongside kind of the same place that um, your age category would be or your sex category. Mm, I hope that that's making sense. It's hard to do it without uh, visualizing it, but I don't want to spend too much time. Um, and, but basically, Excel is a little bit limiting for a database, but you would need to kind of manually update it over time and make sure that you're uh, just including all the most recent numbers. Can we have the same validation data for that is in dates? So the validation data or the validation formulas only really fit to what is inside of a template. And in the example we just did, um, the date was not something that was in question. Um, we just had trust that our um, month was captured correctly. So that's another point potentially that um, your, um, oh, sure, stop the video. That potentially could be another point where you would need to build a validation around the month, but you could do. That. So potentially you could have, if you have an online system, you could make sure that you're only taking Excel files that have um, the correct month on the title or, or more basically uh, the correct month written in the template. So um, just to do a quick example of that one, we'll share our screen again, if that works. So here we can see in the cell, I have a month written out. So it's not actually in this validations tab because this validations tab is only looking at the information that's captured in this template. But this template is going somewhere. This template is being submitted into another system, uh, which is our online system. Um, but I think I'm getting a little ahead of myself. It is possible that you could have a validation for your month though. You could potentially have um, an online submission method that is looking at a specific cell at this point G1 on prevention and support and checking that the month, uh, which in this case is February, is matching the month that you're currently collecting data for. So it is possible to have these validations around a month. Um, da -da. We have routine data. So you could, um, in this case, if you're doing routine data, you could use this exact same template and all you would have to do for each month is just change the month. Um, so right now, if I go to the prevention tab and support, that's where the month is. And when I wanna submit for March, I would just change uh, the month from February to March. And then you've got all of your same validations there and all that you're doing is changing the month. And then from there, um, you would potentially have a clean slate of this template and it with all zeros, but other than that, um, you could potentially use the same template with the same validations for each month uh, for routine reporting. One more question. Um, some of these are a bit advanced. Um, I have not been able to connect DHIS2 and Power BI. Um, we haven't used it for that. But in terms of connecting things to DHIS2, you could potentially um, create an online system that creates an, uh, an, X, an X extract that goes directly into DHIS2. But because DHIS2 and DATAM are done, are owned by governments, it often, um, you can be limited in what software you have that interferes with their system. So it can be, you can be limited um, uh, they would basically have protection on their website. So you would not be able to create your own system to interact with theirs since it's a government website and that um, you would have to basically find ways to make it more easier to interact without actually making a connection between the two because uh, DHIS2 and Datum are a kind of high level uh, 
data processing systems and they're owned by governments. So I have not been able to connect to it with Power BI. Can we build automated reports? Let's do that. Um, I'll look at some more of these questions if we have time at the end, but I would like to at this point switch over to Power BI. But before we do that, uh, one step at a time, we're going to open up our web demo, uh, web demo data ASAP file. And so this is an example of a big online um, or a big database that um, we extract from. So this is a six month extract for, um, in our case, a lot of our programs are around HIV testing. So this is an HIV or treatment. And so this is an HIV testing database, um, but you'll see that we could use this in many different ways. And this is all fake information. So feel free to poke around and play with it. Uh, P1 is province, D1 is district, F1 is facility. Other than that, they should all make sense. Um, you could see your setting of interaction with the patient. Is it community or is it facility? type of facility, um, start time. We have a unique ID, which can come in handy. Um, we can see date of birth, gender, client age, employment status, and quite a bit more. There's a bit of screen, screening questions. But we can see this is kind of a lot. So if you're an m and &E staff and you're given the task of interpreting this data and giving us some easy to read numbers, um, just doing that, looking at the file is going to take you a bit of time. So what we can do to quickly look at it is just highlight all of the information by pressing that little, little triangle at the top. You can do excerpt, or excuse me, insert a pivot table. And I'm assuming most of us have done this before, but we're just going to touch our bases here. Hit OK. Uh, so I said this was an HIV testing. Uh, data set. So for our columns, we're just going to throw in P1, which is again our province indicator. And then we're going to look for our HIV test results. Test results, we'll put that in a row. And since we don't automatically see data populated, it kind of depends on the format of your data sheet. You could put in a unique identifier for your values so, it un so that um, basically the pivot table is able to understand to count the rows as individual rows as individual values. Um, yeah, that's a bit of a funny one, but pivot tables are funny. But um, we can see now that we have the correct totals. So the total down here is the total number of entries on our data sheet. And then we can see that we've got columns A, B, and C which again represent uh, different provinces. And then for our rows, we have different HIV tests. Um, and if we want, we can quickly do some filtering. So I'm coming here to column labels. I'm going to remove the blank and just make it a little easier to read. And um, my country director has spoken to me. He would and she would only like to see the non-reactive and reactive results. So I'm going to take everything out. And I'm going to do non-reactive and reactive only. So this is pivot tables are a way to very quickly highlight your data, which again, do it one more time. I didn't do anything yet. I just clicked here to highlight all of it. I did insert pivot table. And then that brought me to this field. And so you'll notice that there's a bunch of different variables over here. We kind of skipped over that part. But each one of these variables is the exact same as the columns of the data sheet. So here's that P1. Um, we are on uh, test results, which is a little further down here. Um, test result. But potentially, we could also be looking for um, setting or gender, date of birth. We could find all of those values here um, as a way to potentially um, view the data data in a table. So we can also include, as we said, gender. We can find it. And if you would like to have a category 
as a subset to an existing category. In this case, we could break up our test results by gender. All you have to do is click, drag it, and put it underneath the existing category. So previously, all we had was our totals for non-reactive and reactive, but now we can see our non-reactive totals um, as totals, but also by gender. We can see gender A and gender Z have so many um, reactive or non-reactive results in province A, uh, province B, province C, and so on. And potentially you could also play around with this and you could have your gender as your top category and your reactive and non-reactive for each gender and organize it like that. Um, a fun one that's included in here is our key population because there's a lot of category there. So let's take these out and include key population. So now in the same sense that we saw our gender under positive and negative, we could put in um, key population. So in the sense of HIV testing, a lot of the times a program will target certain populations that have been um, identified as key or um, basically needing extra attention or extra support or are more likely to be needing a certain intervention. So these categories are included um, here, and then we can see them again by province. So we can see which province is potentially uh, bringing in more of a key population. But in this visual, we can even see it more broken down by reactive and non-reactive for the test results. But that's kind of a lot of information at once. Let's focus on just the key populations. How, who are we reaching? And so you can, all you have to do to take out a category is just drag it out of the box. Um, so I had test results in there and I dragged it out. Let's do that one more time. We had our test results and we decided we no longer want to see that. So we're just going to drag it out and then it's gone. And a quick way to do a visualization here is simply clicking on recommended charts or pivot chart. And then from there, you'll see several different art options uh, popping up as ways to visualize. And it will automatically include all of the data that you currently have in the table. So it can be uh, quite handy. In this case, I'm gonna do a, a, a percentage stacked column chart. So from here, we can see um, basically all of the key populations. We could see which uh, which province is providing or finding the most of those key populations. So even though he, here the numbers are quite small for some of the categories, here we're looking at it as just a percentage total, and we could compare them by percentage as opposed to absolute value. Um, and so that's one of the little comparisons that we did from um, webinar one. And if you're more interested in the different types of visualizations you could do, I would refer you back to webinar one but I just wanted to show you all there a quick way to quickly visualize this data in Excel, because now we're gonna do the same in Power BI. So when you first, I'm actually gonna need to X this out. So when you first open up Power BI, we're gonna be using that exact same Excel sheet that we just looked at. So all of the same information in the same categories, we're gonna find them again here in Power BI. And once you, once you first open up Power BI, you're gonna see uh, data sources. Where do you want to get your data from? Um, first of all, it's gonna be from Excel. And so this is kind of a part of those manual data processing methods I was referring to. But if you have a network database that's already existing, likely on SQL, you could potentially create a link to SQL uh, with Power BI. Um, and you could do this more easily if it's your own data, if it's from an external source, such as DHIS2, as one of the questions was asking, um, that's gonna be a bit more tricky in terms of access. But if it's, a, if it's your own data set, um, then of course you can just link your existing database to Power BI through SQL. Or if you're doing manual Excels and you're just kind of updating Excel templates, we can also do that. So we're gonna start with the Excel method and then from here, I'm going to load my web demo data file. We're gonna hit open. 
And then from there, it connects to the website. Um, I mean, excuse me, not to the website, to the file. It's reading it. And then you're going to get this menu. So this is the name of the file that we're looking at. And then this is the sheet that has our information on it or our data. So we're clicking on sheet one. And then here you're going to see these are some of the same, these are the same values that we just saw in Excel. So there's our P1, D1, and F1 setting. If we scroll over, we'll find test type. You'll see your gender eventually, your age. If, this is all the same information we just saw. So to upload it, you just hit check and you hit load. And there's no need to transform data. Um, if you don't know what that is, that's fine. We're not covering that in this one. Um, but basically, we're just taking our Excel sheet as it is, and we're loading it directly into Power BI to be able to uh, create a template of visuals. Um, so it's loading there, and that's fine. It should just take a minute. I've already got a window over here with our data already loaded onto it to save us some time. Oh, oops. All right. It loaded anyways. So this is the kind of Power BI interface once you've actually put your data into it. Um, as you can see, it's quite a bit blank before we start. Um, but basically, we're going to be working in these two columns here. You've got your visualizations column, and you've got your data column. And so let's first replicate um, some of that first data that we or visuals that we saw in Excel, which is going to be through a stacked bar chart. Um, we're going to switch over to column because why not? And then we can also switch it back to a bar and we can decide which one is the best to go with. So to insert a visual, you come over to this visuals column and you just click on any visual you would like to try. You could potentially have a column chart. You could do an area chart, a line chart. All of these are different potential visuals that you can put into a Power BI sheet. And Power BI works similarly to Excel in the sense that this file is going to be saved as one file, but you can pull sheets down at the bottom. And each sheet is going to be um, interacting with only itself, which uh, will make sense as we go. But let's start to add a visual. And we're going to start with a stacked uh, column chart here going to the side. You're going to come over to data, click sheet one. And this is the exact sheet that um, we were just looking at in Excel. So uh, we can see since we've highlighted the stacked column chart, we had a few different fields popping up here below. So we've got our x-axis, y-axis, legend, and that's where we're going to really focus on today is these first three categories um, for, or at least these first two, depending on the visual you're looking at. You can get a little more fancy, um, but also you don't really need to. So we're going to look at key population. We're first going to put key population in our y-axis. So we'll have it on the side. And then we're going to also include our province, which is just P1. So we want to look at key population totals by province. Um, so at this point, it's showing full bars. So we've got 100% of our key of our submissions are showing which is not exactly what we want to see. So what we want to put in now is make sure that we're including a legend. So if you have multiple categories for one of your visuals, you need to make sure that you include that variable type or indicator as part of the legend. Um, so we can just drag it and drop it. Um, and from there, we can see it popping up um, in the legend. So here we've got our key populations on the y-axis and our uh, provinces on the x-axis. And this doesn't really look like it's making a lot of sense. So we can also swap these around um, for this indicator, or excuse me, for this visual. And now we're going to put our 
provinces on the y-axis, our key populations on the x-axis. So this is basically just to show you, it's very easy to drag and drop. Um, you can play around uh, with different y-axis or x-axis until you see what you actually are trying to look at. Um, so in this case, um, we're building a dashboard visual to be able to look at the amount of key populations um, interacted with, with this program. And we can see that we've got percentages here, but potentially we could include it as again, um, values as opposed to percentages, so absolute values. And if you would like to ever look at one of them a little with a little more detail, you simply can hover over a bar and then from there, it will highlight um, that section that you're looking at. So here we've got um, we've got our key populations in our legend. We have put our key populations on our x-axis. So actually, we're looking at them going across, and we put our provinces going up and down. Um, so here we can see that province B has interacted with the most clients, and of those clients. Um, quite a large amount are not a key population. If you look at the highlighted uh, message, you can see it's actually 3,301. Um, healthcare providers, 341. But maybe we want to put a filter in and start to filter out some of these options, such as not a key population, because um, that one seems to be kind of skewing the rest of our data. We can't really see it. So if you want to add a filter, you're going to come over here and you're going to deselect from the visual because um, as soon as you click on a different visual option it's going to change the visual that you have selected so if you want to do something outside of one visual you just click out of it and then you would come over here to slicer is what it's called but you might recognize this image as the filter for from excel and you would just click that and so now we've got a new box or a little We'll call it box, uh, visual on our, our table. So you can see on page one right now, I've got two visuals. We've got the stacked column chart or stacked bar chart. And now we've got a new one that right now doesn't have anything in it. Um, so if we want to make a filter for our key populations, we've simply added a slicer. And to make the type of filter, you would just drag and drop your um, category or your indicator into the field, uh, labeled field. So here we have a filter for key populations. So we could potentially just look at long distance truckers. And now we're only looking at long distance truck drivers for those two. Or maybe we only want to look at um, the sex workers. So you can now start to see that we're filtering this visual a bit. Um, and in order to select multiple categories of a filter, as opposed to starting off in this little first tab, of add data to your visual, you're gonna come here. Oops, I made a mistake there. You're going to always make sure that you're clicking on the visual that you want to format. So you need to click on the filter. And then once you come over here, you can see that you can format your visual. In this case, I'm going to format my uh, filter. So from here, you're gonna come over to, and they call it a slicer, you're gonna to come to slicer things and you could have it as a vertical list um, tiles also look nice um, you can then from here do selection and you just want to turn this off currently it has it set that you would have to hold down control to do multiple selections um, but i think that's a bit silly so we don't need to do that um, and now now you can click on multiple populations so we want to click on everything except for uh, the key populations. So now we have all of them but the key population. We've got a great chart, but we don't really see any numbers, um, which is maybe a bit uh, useless at that point, unless you're just going for a visual. If you would like to include numbers, you would click back on the chart you would like to edit, um, which in this case is the stacked column chart, bar chart, excuse me. And then again, you're gonna come over to that format. So in the same way that we formatted our filter, you're gonna format your graph and you're going to add data labels. All right, so now we've got data labels. 
end, potentially, you can have two visuals on one sheet. So I kind of like the look of the um, uh, percentage chart. So we're going to also make a new visual with the same information, including um, the percentages for the value. So right now we have the total values for population data. And now we're going to add another one to the same sheet. And we're going to do it with um, percentages. So you can see you can kind of move around your filters and your visuals. You can make them fit um, to how you like in your table. Um, and let's now start to add information to this. So you can see we've added a new blank graph. And right now, the x-axis and the y-axis are um, blank. There's nothing there. So in order to add something, we can drag down our key populations. Um, oops, I keep doing this. I'm swapping these guys. All right, so key populations are here. And then again, we just want to look at our provinces. So at this point, we can see the total numbers, but we can also see the percentage uh, makeup of those total numbers. All right, so we've got those full bars. So that means that we are missing something. That means we're missing our legend. So we are going to have to go back, add a key population, which is um, the the type of category that has multiple categories, and you can put it in your legend. And then from there, we can again, we're still selected on this new little graph we've inserted. We can come over, we can format it, and we can show our data labels. All right, so at this point, it should start to be looking a little bit more informative. We can see the total numbers um, that each province has in interacted with, we'd see the percentages um, of that population of the total interactions at that point. We can see the interact, excuse me, the percentages of um, the uh, uh, province's interactions with those certain populations. So we could switch these around. So right now we have it by province, but if we want, we could do these by key population type. Mm. And then from there, it would need to be. OK, well, it's being a bit funny with me today, but that's fine. Um, in general, you can see a lot of what what you'll be doing when you're doing Power BI is kind of just trial and error. And then from there, trying to um, identify what works. Um, so in this case, it looks like we're going to be going this way because, um, actually, no, we can do this. We can, if we want to have the same information organized by province, all we have to do is then put the province down here in the legend. Um, but then also have it um, up top. And we put it in the wrong spot again. There you go. That's what I was trying to show you. OK, so now we can also see, even though you've got your total numbers over here, um, the exact same information is being shown in the chart to the right with the same filters that we have up top, um, but potentially now we can also see for each key population which province is um, interacting with this key population the most. Um, so you've got two slightly different sets of information here, um, but all referring to the same data set. And this is about six months worth of data, so we would also want to maybe put in a filter here to only look at a certain month or a certain week. So to do that, we're clicking on Slicer, which is, again, our filter option. And from here, we're going to add a date. Um, in this case, I'm going to just use end time, which is the, the time that the submission was complete. 
So from here, now we can see all of the same data that we're visualizing and we're filtering for. We can do it by dates. Um, so we can see that the data starts in March and it goes up until September. So again, it's six months of data. Um, so we could potentially look at just the first month, um, March, just the month of March. And you can see these numbers suddenly drop for the total values. Um, the percentages are uh, changing accordingly. And then you've got your filters up top. And potentially, again, your filters, now that we've put them up here, maybe we want to change them from tiles. Uh, we could change them to uh, a drop down list. And then from there, you can select multiple. Uh, I kind of like them as tiles. but it's an aesthetic choice. So all of these on sheet one are going to be connected to the same filters. And you also don't want to kind of overload um, any one page. So we'll just call this tab key populations. And then when we want to start to make a new set of visuals to focus on a different indicator or a different area of focus for your program, you just add a new sheet, a uh, new page, excuse me, and you click new page. Um, so at this point, we have these, and they're not going anywhere. They're going to stay there. And we can now start to build a new set of visuals. Um, and for this one, we could do potentially a line chart. So we could look at our information over time. Um, as I said, this is an HIV testing data set. So we could look at our test results over time. So we're going to pull in test results. We'll put this on the y-axis. And then again, because we're, there's multiple categories of test results, you're going to also put the test results in a legend so that we could see the different test results and the colors they have. Uh, right now, we don't have anything on the x-axis, so that's just one point. But again, I'm going to use that end time as a date. Um, and here now, we can see over time the different um, trends. So we can see um, around the month of May, the tests are quite high, there's quite a large volume. But then as we go further on, it's kind of teetering off. So it looks like most of this information came in between April and May. Um, and then maybe they start to have a different focus. But also, it is a bit hard to read with all the lines at once. So we can, of course, add a filter. And hopefully by now, you might know how to do this. It's simply coming here to the little filter button, which is in this case called a slicer. And because we want to uh, filter it by test result, we're going to um, come here. Again, search in our data for test results. We've got it. And from here, um, we can make this little box a bit smaller. And you can pick if you want to just see non-reactive or reactive. If you want to have two at the same time, you have to come over to this little format, um, allow for multiple selections without control. Don't know why it's like that automatically, but it's fine. Um, so now once you've turned this off, again, you can click multiple at the same time. Um, maybe you just want to look at one. You just want to see the total test reactive. And if you don't want to see this whole time period at once, we can add another filter. And from here, be able to um, filter by date. And so again, you could look at the specific month or a specific um, set of weeks that you would like. So we've got six months worth of data here at this point. But let's maybe do um, a little less than that. So you again can specify by month by clicking on the calendar title. You can use the little uh, slider if you would like. Um, so there's no real uh, clear up and down with this information, but we can see that it goes up for the first two months. And then by the time we get to later on in the year, um, our totals have gone down. Um, and so you can do you can have a filter or a visualization for any of the different categories that you have in your Excel file. Um, let's call this one testing trends. 
So we could potentially add a filter for um, gender. You could add a filter for facility versus community. And uh, let's do a filter for facility versus community. So we're going to add a new filter, which is a slicer. And maybe you don't remember what your facility versus community um, category was called. So if you ever want to look at your data, all you have to do is come over to this page or this side of the window here where you've got report view versus data view. And if you do data view, you can see that exact same Excel that we originally export imported. Um, all of the data is here. If you need to do any sort of data transformation, you could potentially do it from this uh, window just by right clicking on the um, categories or do any, some sort of drop down. Um, and you can filter a bit. But um, I can see that the uh, facility, um, the facility in the community is right here under setting. So I can just uh, reference my, my data here, and then I can come back to my report view, and I can continue making my report. Uh, so in order to add my facility versus community filter, I go to that filter for um, setting, and now we can see. Uh, potentially, especially looking at the scales here, how it looks different if I click on the community-based or facility-based. So we can see facility is a little bit lower than community. Um, you could potentially, again, for your trend lines, you could add data points or uh, data labels, um, which can be a little bit hard to read, but at the same time, they are there. And you can also always just hover right over the, the the visual that you're interacting with to make a point of showing uh, the number at a specific time. And again, these same hovering can work also with key populate or our previous uh, categories. We've already got data labels in there, but if you wanted to really emphasize it, if you hover above a certain section, it will highlight that section and kind of give you um, the summary. So you can see that it's province one, not a key population. Total count is 640 for this uh, time period. Um, and there we go. We're kind of, I hope that you're starting to make a bit of sense of this. Um, if we want to have a couple, again, uh, selections at once, we come to the settings of our filter, slicer settings, selection, select multiple. And from here, we can put them all back in. And also add these guys back in. The data labels are a bit funny. It seems that it doesn't want to include all of them, but maybe we're also overloading it. Uh, so let's just take out these data labels for this one. Potentially, again, you can include two visuals like we did in the first one. So for example, here you could add a matrix or a data table, um, but let's do that on the last one um, to make sure we get through all the fun stuff. So this last one, um, I just want to show you how to make um, a hierarchy with your uh, data, which I will explain. So here, let's just look at the total tests uh, done in each province. So we're not looking at uh, the, the provinces finding the positives or the negatives, but we're just doing this uh, for the total tests complete. Um, in order to do that, let's do a comparison with a bar chart, or excuse me, column chart. So this, we're going to do um, total HIV tests. And let's bring it down. Again, you can always move around your graphs. I kind of like to put my, my visuals at the bottom and then my filters at the top. We can see again, the total number is 5,386. Um, so we could break this by province, and here we can see province A, B, and C. Um, which is great. But we can also kind of start to, uh, again, um, make a hierarchy. And potentially, you could bounce around here. You could do, if you wanted to, uh, columns stacked. Um, well, let's just stick with uh, a regular column for the moment. Okay, 
So to do a hierarchy, you're going to find the first or like the highest uh, level of data and then do create a hierarchy. And what's that do? What that is doing is letting Power BI know that you have a category of data inside of itself. Um, so that means that we have provinces and then we also have districts um, and we want to include all of them inside. So we are going to put our districts inside of our provinces and we're just going to again to do that come to our district hit those three dots. We're going to add it to the hierarchy that we just created with province. And since um, the data is already formatted in a way that the um, districts and provinces are all aligning with each other on the Excel sheet, our BI is very quickly able to just understand that these are actually related um, and they can be um, a hierarchy with each other. And so lastly, we have our facilities. And to do this, it's the exact same as we did with district. We're going to add facilities to the hierarchy of provinces. OK, so what does that mean? What did we just do? Now, when we look at provinces, you could keep provinces by itself, but we also have a provincial hierarchy. So from here, if we now put um, provinces in the x-axis, um, see, it doesn't like that because we have in the legend, it does not match one of the existing uh, variables because we put the province in the legend before we made it a hierarchy. So let's take that out. All right. Um, and we actually don't need a legend in this case because we can see it right on the visual. So we can see here we have quite a few uh, columns, and this is because we have quite a few facilities. Um, so hmm, where is this guy? All right, it's being a bit funny. Let's take this out and put it back in. There we go. All right, trial and error is always your friend. So what I was looking for for was these little arrows. So at this point, we can start to uh, drill down, or we can drill up. So now we've just gone from facility to district. And from here, we can go from district to province. So here, let's throw some data label on there. We can see our provincial totals, but when we're right here clicking on the visual, so potentially you're giving this report to your facility staff or your um, your program management, and you can give them quick uh, provincial totals or country totals, and then by creating those little hierarchies with the data, by just clicking on those little three dots, create hierarchy, you can put those information inside of each other. And then from there, you can start to drill down. And you can go to district and facility level. Um, and if you can see, it's a bit small on the screen. Um, but you've actually got the brackets of provinces and then um, districts, which are just those numbers. And, and then the facilities are listed there as well. So this could be a very handy tool, especially if you throw a um, another stir slash filter for your date that you're looking at, in this case, end time. So from here, we can see, um, again, we could zoom in on a specific month, and we could see those district totals. But if we want to, all we have to do is click up. And now we can show our boss the um, provincial totals. So here, I'm just going to call this tab um, the totals. We've got here a template that we've just made that we've got our key populations we've interacted with. Um, if, you, if this is too much information for your audience, all you have to do is just take out one of these visuals. Um, and in order to take it out, you can just highlight it, hit delete, and then boom, it's gone. Um, and we can focus on just this one. Um, but you could also control Z and bring it back if you decide you want to keep it. Um, we've got our testing trends. So here again, you can view kind of any sort of indicator over time for your program. 
And then again, you've got all sorts of different filters for um, age, sex, potential, different. Um, uh, we didn't uh, do a filter by age category, but you could do a filter by age category. Um, we've got the date filter, all of your data filters. And then again, you've got your totals again, and you can have interactive drilling up and down as well as adding any of the filters that we saw before. You could potentially add a filter for only to look at positive tests or negative tests, um, things like that. Um, and so once you have this file saved, you can um, reuse it as you like. Similarly, in the sense that you're reusing a data template, all you're doing is you would change the data that's inside this. So if you're having a weekly situation room or a monthly situation room, you're likely to have about maybe 10 of these visuals. You don't want to have too many because, especially if it's daily, usually those meetings for your program would be very brief. Um, you would try to keep it under an hour, maybe half an hour, so that you can quickly get a summary of everything that's happening, but of course return to your duties. So you want to have these visuals already set up, um, but being able to interact with in case anyone wants to focus on anything in that meeting. Um, but you would go through your dashboards um, and you can review your most current data. And so to make sure you're using the most current data in this, um, you simply would change your data source. So to change your data source, uh, we didn't really get into these up here on the top. But as long as you stick with visualizations and data, I think that can give you a great starting point. And then if you Google some tutorials, you can get a bit further. Um, again, if you pay for this option, you could link it to the internet. But just having this slide ready to present or this kind of presentation of dashboards ready to present on a weekly or daily uh, interval could definitely save you quite a bit of time. So again, to refresh this data, you're going to go to File, and then from there, you're going to go to Not Get Data, um, which is an easy mistake, but you're going to go to Options and Settings. So once you do File, Options, and Settings, you're going to do Data Source Settings. And then from here, this is where our current data source is. So to change it, you could simply go to Change Data Source. You could browse. And um, if I had a newer version of my template, I could just click it. And then as long as all of the categories are the same, so if you're collecting the same data each week and um, the categories are always kept the same, you could just swap out the existing numbers, the new numbers, and you could click on your new data source. And just like that, all of the graphs are going to be ready to go. You'll be able to interact with them and you'll be able to um, basically use them weekly or um, a week or daily situation room or potentially a monthly or quarterly report. Um, and then you'll be able to interact with them and kind of focus on a specific uh, filter or a specific key population, what have you. Um, if you were to go for the paid version of this, you could publish your set of interactive visuals to a website and then interact with it on a website. But you do not have to do that. You could definitely do it just right here in Power BI. Um, there's a few different um, like page views. And so then you can make it a little bigger, a little smaller. You can look at it on mobile. Um, but in general, if you'd like to focus on a presentation mode, you could just hide all of these little ribbons. And then from there, you can go through your um, report with your whoever you need to. And that should um, cover that. All right, I see we've got about seven minutes left. I hope that you found this beneficial. Um, Let's go to some questions. Um, Andres, um, I can go ahead and read out the questions to you so you can keep a Power BI pulled up if that's easier. Sure. Uh, yeah. So the first question we have is, um, why is it that we, before we import the data to Power BI, uh, we worked on issues identifying activities? Can we work on it after um, being imported um, on Power BI? Issues identifying activities. You could. I think if you, the do. question I think is trying to say, like, can you edit the data once it's already in Power BI? 
you could, um, but then potentially it would be saving the data to the Power BI file instead of your template file. So I personally would recommend um, editing your data in Excel and then just refreshing that um, data source to Power BI in the sense that um, as soon as you have your corrected Excel, you could do um, a refresh to the Power BI visuals by selecting the most current um, data source. But you could, if you wanted to edit your data in Power BI through this data view. Um, but I really think that uh, the best use of Power BI is through its visualization side. And if you're going to do some data editing, um, I would do that outside of Power BI. But if you would like, you could do it in Power BI. But I would not. Uh, I personally do not. Great. Um, thanks. Um, can you um, stop sharing your screen and then start again? It looks like it didn't um, load this time. Sure. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, in the meantime, um, the next question is, how can one share a dashboard prepared in Power BI with other team members? Sure. So um, you could save it just as a file. So, so in the exact same sense that you would say in send slideshow, um, or you could send um, an Excel file, you would simply save your file as um, every like MO or webinar two. Mm. And so now I have this saved file with all of, it's got the data in it already. And so I could send this to my colleagues and then from there they could use it for their presentations or their review. Um, but then you just share the file like that, the exact same way that you would share a PowerPoint presentation or an Excel file. Great, thanks so much. It looks like we're still not able to see your screen. Um, so maybe we can okay. turn it off and maybe uh, answer the next question without yeah. it and give it a chance to maybe catch up with itself. Um, does sure. Power BI have a validation checks already or will we have to upload an already validated Excel file? Um, you could look at the information that's in Power BI, but it doesn't have a validation. It doesn't have validations built into it. Um, you could build validations into, into the data of Power BI, but um, I would think it'd be much easier to do that at the source as opposed to um, once you're visualizing it. Um, basically, you would want to make sure your data is correct before you start to have dashboards with it. Um, I think that's the step before the visualization process. Um, so you could potentially try to validate it in Power BI, but I think you're kind of doing that in the opposite order. Great. Um, the next question is, what if I want to indicate both percentages and numbers on the same chart? How do I go about that about it? And if you wanted to maybe try sharing your screen one more time, if not, um, sure. If it doesn't work, um, we'll, see. we'll see. In terms of putting them on the same chart, that would work if you're doing um, if you would have a secondary access. Um, I didn't include that. Oops. I didn't include that in these examples. But um, if you were to potentially have a secondary access um, to show, for example, yield, um, so like total tests. Uh, okay, I don't want to confuse you more. If if you're looking at just these two visuals, there's no way to potentially have um, percentages and the total values on the same one, unfortunately, um, at least that I'm aware. Maybe through some fancy um, settings you could get there, but I would kind of keep them separate um, because this visual visualizes the percentage and this one is visualizing the, um, total, the, the total values. But if you're having a chart, a chart that has a secondary access, so for example, you're combining a line chart and a trend line. So if I had, if for example, these were percentages and then I had bar, a bar chart on kind of behind it or with this, then you could have both a percentage and um, a total value because you have two different accesses, um, which if you open up the visualization, when you have a secondary y-axis option here, this is where you can start to play around with having two values on your y-axis. Um, so at that point, you could have both a percentage and a total value. Um, but if you're looking at a 
stacked uh, stacked column percentage versus total value. Those are two separate ones. Um, but if you had a secondary access for either a, a line chart or a bar chart, then you could have both of those. Yes. Great, and I think we have time for just one more question. Um, we're going to go ahead and um, have um, Andres answer the remain the remaining questions um, written, and we'll um, send that out via email um, sometime next week. Um, so don't uh, worry if your question didn't get answered. We will get to it um, and and give you a written response. Um, so for the last question today, what is the difference between a report and a dashboard in Power BI? Okay, um, so those are basically the same thing. Um, a Power BI dashboard is basically a type of report. Um, so it also depends on basically how you use it from your side as the audience or as the user. Um, so they are basically the same things. Um, a dashboard is going to be the more interactive component. So if you're viewing, if you're viewing the reports and you're interacting with them, you could call call it a dashboard, if you're using it as a way to review your data. Um, but if you're just taking screenshots or extracts of the visuals, and then you would print it out in a report, um, then you're using those visuals for your report. Um, but it kind of just depends on the way that you're using the tool. Um, but potentially, Power BI could be used to make report visuals or reporting tables, but it could also be used for a dashboard. Great. Thank you so much, um, Andres, for presenting today. Um, a great webinar. Also, thank you, um, Josephine, for answering some of the USAID-specific questions. Um, and again, uh, this webinar was put on by um, PEPFAR and USAID, so we thank them so much as well. Um, and we hope you have an excellent rest of your day. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, all. Thank